Hello, my name is Cal Moloney from Richmond, Virginia, and I'm an anarchist. I'm Matt Badalioli, I'm from Richmond, Virginia as well, and I'm also an anarchist. And today we're bringing to you the news from Underground. This time we're going to cover a survey done by Reason in regards to the millennials. Uh, so we're going to talk about what is a millennial, because uh, I don't really have a good idea I'm grasping that concept, but I have a good understanding where I guess the meaning is derived from. Uh, but in regards to this survey, they are showing that most people under the age of lower on 30 ish and under don't have a really good understanding of <laughs> what is government. Uh, in regards to socialism and capitalism, uh, and it's not entirely their fault, right? You know, these are people who've been to the rungs of indoctrination camps, and so government doesn't really do a good job in their textbooks in defining these particular terms, right? They want to confuse you, mislead you, and combine abstract and concrete concepts all together, and so these are the results in which we're going to kind of go over. Uh, so what are your thoughts on millennials? Um, well, I know I am one. I know you are right. one. Um, what exactly the criteria is to be a millennial, I think a lot of it has to do with, um, well, I definitely know, like, uh, if you are born before the 80s, I don't think you're a millennial. Right. Um, but, uh, bad guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with, like, what technology you've been exposed to, you know? Yeah. Um, and, like, what, um, I guess, what events, you know, um, like, like the internet revolution, um, uh, cell phone, GPS stuff, like the age of technology that wasn't really, that, that sort of started to come up in the 80s, boomed in the 90s, and the early 2000s, and just been increasing ever since. Uh, sort of defines a millennial, you know, the, uh, the technology, the events, and the, uh, I guess, current events of the, uh, the 2000s, uh, 2000 era. Yeah, uh, I guess I would say it seems like uh, the gamer generation. Uh, you know, Nintendo is coming out uh, in the 80s. Uh, Super Nintendo, PlayStation, uh, things were not accessible beforehand, so that it has a lot to do with, I guess, uh, electronics. Uh, so I guess the internet would be one of them, and uh, some people also kind of call it like the post-9-11 generation. Uh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that, actually. Yeah, so that's like a new kind of associative terms. Uh, mm -hmm. But in, in general, it's kind of difficult to generalize uh, entire populations. The only thing that we can kind of denote from this generation of tax slaves is that we're not as well off as past generations, of course. Uh, so you can kind of look at older generations of uh, tax slaves before the millennials who were well catered, uh, who had the least amount of restrictions on trade, the dollar was worth uh, mm -hmm. a lot of value, a lot higher, uh, more accessibility and in, uh, in economic freedoms at the cost of, uh, hey, today, us. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, eventually bills have to be paid, and, you know, right. so the, the good life of the uh, previous generations are paid for by, I guess we're in the same generation, uh, Mars. Yeah. You know? The, the millennial cut-up date is usually like 1982 to uh, early 1990s, uh, but that's kind of what happens in the beginning, right? Politicians say, hey, we have Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, all these different government services and programs, so, well, the first year is going to cost, oh, yes, this much, but they don't tell you, of course, when the politicians are out of office, you know, they can punt off the, the bill to the next generation to the next generation and now hey it's our generation now mm -hmm. and uh yeah and we're fucked uh so yeah so, we don't have all right uh, bye guys <laughs> yeah <laughs> essentially essentially and so that's my take on our take on millennials uh so i guess uh, we're going to talk about this uh, interesting survey uh, yeah. and talk about i guess could you uh, tell us what it's uh in <clears throat> yeah well it was done by reason magazine which i'm i'm sympathetic towards the agenda of honestly although i'll see some criticisms here um, now it says a reason group survey of 2,000 Americans between the ages of, 20, of 18 and 29 finds 66 percent of millennials believe government is inefficient and wasteful. A substantial increase since 2009, when only two percent of millennials said government was inefficient and wasteful. Yeah, that is a, a substantial increase. Uh, so, so, so it's great. So that just needs to show that people are finally starting to understand that there is something inherently wrong. Uh, and most people we do talk to out there uh, doing these Spreading Anarchy series uh, come to that same conclusion that maybe perhaps that there is something wrong with government, but the fact that people say well, we just have to fix it kind of denotes that there's a problem and it's kind of broken to begin with. Um, and that's just the crucial of, I guess, the, the argument that, well, how about the other side of it that it was designed that way to begin with, right? Uh, but at least uh, we're going to come to see, and especially in the findings of Social Security, 73% of millennials favor allowing private accounts for Social Security. 51% favor private accounts, even if it means cutting Social Security benefits for current and future retirees. Because 53% of millennials say Social Security is unlikely to exist when they retire. And unlikely is not the word to put there. Yeah. The program is entirely insolvent, all right? Um, it's got maybe 15 to 20 years at, at the most. Um, the numbers do yeah. not add up. No, it doesn't work. So um, I, I believe, honestly, like if you wanted to make it sustainable, you'd have to make the um, retirement age about 76, and then it could sustain for a, a long enough time to make it politically profitable again. Right. Um, 
but even then, eventually those you know that those bills have to come too. All right. Um, because remember, you know, the retirement age as of 1935 was 65 years old. However, the average lifespan in the United States was 62. Now the average lifespan, I think, for for men is uh, 79, but. Um, when you add women into that, it's like 80 something, early early 80s. Uh, so that's con that's uh, increased considerably, but the the retirement ages remain the same. Um, so if it was only meant to be a temporary f uh, New Deal program in the 30s, uh, and uh, even then the retirement age was beyond the average lifespan, then you know can imagine now you know 70 uh, 70 years later, uh, 80 years later almost. Um, it, with the the new reti with the retirement age staying the same, life expectancy is increasing. Um, you know, the inflation too. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just uh, um, basically, if you did this as a businessman, you would be arrested. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a Ponzi scheme in which you're forced to participate at gunpoint. Mm -hmm. um, so no freedom to cancel or subscribe. No freedom to kind of compete otherwise uh, against this monopoly on uh, retirement. Right? Uh, you know, these these older generations had a lifetime to to gather their resources to prepare for that time, and instead they've uh, opted for the easy way out of violence and forcing the unborn to be enslaved. Uh, to provide for them. Now, instead. of course, it's not entirely their fault. I mean, any amount of money that you save has been depreciating since they would right. have saved it. So, I mean, what are you going to expect someone to do? You know, keep a dollar from the 30s. It's yeah. going to be worth how much, you know. They, they fell for that uh, government distraction thing that they're on their side and they provide solutions, but they don't. Um, the yeah. abolition of the, the state is the only way out of any of this mess. Uh, so that's Social Security. Uh, and it's good that a lot of people see that this is not something that you will have when it's time for us to retire. All right, so let's, you know, let's plan that out in advance so that we can handle that situation and not you know, be taken off guard by it. Right. Um, but being surprised that Social Security is going to end is like being surprised that the sun sets every evening. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. Uh, but no. <laughs> it's like all, a lot of the unfunded liabilities you find in Detroit. And this is inevitable uh, for all cities and for any government monopoly. Uh, remember, the, the cost always increases as, as the age as you find with Social Security retirement. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next part would be, uh, I guess oh, you can cover the next part. Sure thing, yeah. 64% of millennials say cutting government spending by 5% would help the economy. Now, I imagine when they ask the question, I have no factual evidence of this, but if they, when they ask the question, they probably asked it in terms of 5%. So I'm curious to know how high that number would have had to go before for the number to A, the 64% to have increased, or before it would have decreased. Yeah. Um, and then when, you know... There's how many people would have um, answered the way I would if they said 100%. Yeah, you know? like, <laughs> so, yeah how about 6, 7, 10%? Yeah, like, keep going, you know? <laughs> there are 95% almost there. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's where you'll find in some of these uh, particular questionnaires that they provide. But reason, reason I find it to be kind of a minarchist organization doesn't, so of course, for me, it doesn't seem like they're going to completely provide objective definitions for all this entirely. Um, you know, so not to say that uh, we're in 100% uh, in support of some of the aims of uh, reason. Uh, they seem sometimes to be very constitutionalist. Uh, so sometimes that can uh, be exhibited in the questions that they, they do show. Uh, so, but 5% would help the economy. At least they understand that at least cutting some of that off, you know, would improve the economy. Uh, right. How about an extra 95% we skyrocket, you know, the hell off this planet. We have, you know, uh, space-faring civilizations. Mm, uh, cancer, yeah. all these diseases. <laughs> oh, Imagine what yeah. you can do when you have uh, ownership over 100% of your own property, right? Like you can own your own body, mm -hmm. right? Uh, <laughs> imagine There's no that. more IP keeping people from yeah 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 a free and voluntary society that uh, this finally starts to establish when people talk you know uh, population wise like well you know we're not overpopulated but even if that were the case that would propel us forward to go to you know colonize the moon right, or planets right. Or yeah you know that's the thing like you'll notice um, when certain things like water uh, when there's a shortage of like like water or there's a drought or something like that well then that means and then there's a higher demand for water because that's so people need to water their lawns take showers drink you know whatever. Um, then it's like, oh, well, you don't water your lawn more than this amount of times per, you know. But, but you'll notice like, when it comes to, you know, uh, more or less totally privatized uh, institutions such as like like alcoholic beverages, like beer or something like that, when there's an increased demand for beer, what you have is more beer. Yeah. Not yeah. people uh, telling you not to stop drinking beer, and this goes for just about, about everything, you know. Yeah. They'll, they'll, uh, the market will find a way to mm -hmm. provide. Yeah. Uh, the government will find a way to cut it off and shut it down. Uh, uh, so yeah. 50% want a society where wealth is distributed according to achievement. 
Uh, and again, this goes in terms of the public indoctrination schooling, which the government doesn't properly define uh, distribution. So they say wealth distribution, aka it's theft. Uh, so for example, if we, here at our uh, freedom gatherings, we distribute a lot of food, potlucks, and distribute a lot of uh, you know invitements. And so that's distribution. That's free. That's voluntary. Uh, that's that's loving. That's caring. That's giving. Uh, the distribution terms in which government uses that that term. Uh, oftentimes, you'll find government agencies trying to co-op business definition in terms. Sometimes, for example, IRS calling you a customer um, right the ABC store thanking you for your business right yeah it's like look I don't have any choice like I wish I had a choice I wish I could conveniently buy I wish uh, I could this. put you out of business yeah put you out of business or I'll buy this stuff conveniently when I go to Kroger right uh, so distribution is another word for theft right this is a fancy way to make it sound very socially acceptable oh it's a distribution oh that sounds nice it sounds fanciful that sounds caring but it's not uh, when it comes to government it's theft uh, it's stealing from him at gunpoint to give it to someone else arbitrarily for whatever arbitrary means and reasons um, so that's not uh, that's so 57 percent advocating for that that's uh, well you can again blame uh, public indoctrination for not giving them the, the correct term and meaning for that um, you know I mean it's possible when some people heard that question they were thinking you know the uh, in, in the way of well you know you you work so hard and you earn this amount of money and that's how the wealth is distributed you know so I mean that's not an unrealistic uh, interpretation of that, that goes that against question. more like a uh, uh, objective value of uh, labor yeah, then. I guess yeah. so, yeah. Yeah. Um, moving on? Yeah, moving on. All right, so 55% uh, say uh, reducing regulations would help the economy. Well, which is, uh, I guess, halfway there, which is kind of good. Uh, at least they understand there's a restriction on trade, uh, and you see kind of increasing, I guess, in our generation now, the millennials, we see that there, and th there is so much restriction. So every piece of legislation is a restriction on your life and what you can and cannot do. Uh, mostly it's trying to restrict you what you cannot do. Uh, like Uber cars or, or Lyft, for example, right now, trying to be shut down by a lot of uh, competitive cartels like the taxi cabs in D.C. Restrictions on finding cheap and awesome ways for transportation. Uh, so we kind of see, we see a lot of this stuff visibly now, whereas in the past, starting off, it's not as, uh, you don't see a tremendous amount, but increasingly so over time, they start to add up. Um, right. It's like taxes, and now it's like nearly half our income stolen. Now you see, uh, and Reason came out with interesting uh, survey, or, or an interesting finding that they found like in the past 60 years of restriction on trade, you're nearly 70% poorer because of that. Uh, because those are offset costs of like tariffs and imports uh, and other areas in which businesses have to offset their costs to kind of pay off government regulations instead of putting that money into em hiring new employees and better improvement of products or an in, in, in expansion of their business. Like for example, here in Hardywood in Richmond, uh, they were told by the city council members that yeah, you don't have to pay you know taxes for beer. Beer is not a meal. And so like, are you sure? You positive? We're coming here uh, to make sure that's not the case. A year later, the city council said, yeah, actually, uh, uh, <laughs> you owe us money. Uh, tens of thousands, I think forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 worth of uh, taxes, because back taxes, because now they regard beer as a meal. Uh, whereas that forty, fifty thousand $50,000 could have gone for you know, an expansion or maybe having a you know, expert beer mixologist. Or, or wages or lower costs. Yeah, or, or anything. Uh, Jesus, yeah. Uh, but this goes to hiring, uh, going to the pocket, pockets of right. local rulers to sustain their lifestyle at your expense. Uh, so imagine that if uh, these people actually had to work in, in, the, in the real market uh, instead of the area public sector of, of stealing people's wealth. Uh, so 74% of millennials say government has a responsibility to guarantee every citizen has a place to sleep and enough to eat. Simply put, government cannot do that. Yeah, it is impossible. Um, and I mean, um, if you draw a simple supply and demand chart, I don't mean to be like oversimplify the situation, but it is really basic. Uh, if you put something to a zero price point, like uh, even living standards, then the amount of demand that creates is so much that even if you employed every single person in that particular industry, you could not possibly guarantee that amount of demand. So what they naturally have to do is ration it. So if you were to guarantee everyone en uh, enough to eat or a place to sleep, well, then you have to ration food, you'd have to ration you know, housing, and none of us really want that. And that's, yeah. that's the way it would have to turn out, and that's the way it always has turned out historically. Uh, look at Venezuela, for example, in which the government there is trying to uh, provide uh, affordable food for everyone. And now <laughs> the prices have skyrocketed and now there are actually bread lines uh, for toilet paper, for diapers, for, for, for food, for electronics. Um, and that's what you have when government... And it's not really that... It's not that poor of a country either. Right. So the yeah. fact that... I mean, they got oil reserves on. Yeah. So, you know, the, the fact that they have to have such, you know, simple commodities uh, restricted and rationed is really, you know, such a show of their poor economic policies. Right. I mean, of course, also remember that the government has a lot of laws and a lot of cities restriction on actually feeding the poor and providing uh, food and parks mm -hmm. and stuff like that for the poor. So, and you know. Of, uh, and of course, the, the 
the political parties that are in power that typically do these things the most extremes are usually with the, the title the workers party or the you know the people's party or whatever and yeah. the people are just like starving it's kind of kind yeah. of comical from the outside looking in but you know yeah I mean, like for example if they cared about housing people they would not be uh foreclosing putting people out into the street mm -hmm. you know for, for not paying property taxes and this happens often like there's a guy sure. in dc who didn't pay like 153 dollars in property taxes uh, and he paid off the mortgage in full and he's like retired and like sorry put his house on the lien foreclosed and threw him off on the street and that's how the government creates housing for people right under bridges um, in gutters, uh, they do not create housing at all in, in that regard, and it comes at the expense of everyone else. And, and of course, the uh, the how the public housing programs. Uh uh, generally, a lot of housing is actually torn down to erect those those housing buildings, and they become uh, a segregation area. So they, we segregate the poor from the rest of society, and then destroy their neighborhoods that they do live in via the war on drugs mm -hmm. uh, and this awful police force that we have. Yeah, and we're going to go. Maybe perhaps we'll cover a topic uh, sometime soon in the uh, housing bubble collapse, and that was a result of government. So it's not government's uh, involvement in creating uh, housing. Actually, they created a lot of homeless people after that yeah. uh, involvement. So, uh, so we'll go over that soon too, maybe uh, sometime this month. Sure. All right. So, oh God. Uh, yeah. Seventy-one percent favor raising the federal minimum wage to ten dollars and ten cents an hour. And as remember, we uh, we kind of covered this topic uh, recently in our analyzing minimum wage video. Uh, but again, that discriminates against the poor, it discriminates against minority, mm -hmm. There's, it doesn't really increase uh, employment, it has nothing to do with providing employment. Uh, it's outlawing jobs doesn't increase jobs. Right. <laughs> You're outlawing my options. Right, <laughs> especially for those who are starting off in the market, those who are greatly in need of uh, creating uh, these vocational skills to add to their resume, right? Uh, you, you restrict that. Uh, you restrict their freedom to negotiate, to contract. Uh, to say, you know, I could do either this better shop, better, better service. I know I don't have a resume. I need to build that up. You know, I'll, I'll do it for a dollar or two less, right? Uh, but government says, sorry, you are not allowed to have voluntary consensual contracts with other people. Uh, and so they unlock that and they make it criminal. Uh, and so, of course, as a result, you'll have, uh, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people advocate for that. You know, you look at, uh, and like there, there's an organization called the Industrial Rules Workers Association or something like that. and The uh, uh, Industrial Workers of the World. Of the world, right. And so they'll, they'll outline like areas of uh, wage exploitation. It's like, great. So they, like, for example, paying for your own uniform, they'll you'll find as a uh, wage slavery. It's like, well, out of the outlines that I see there, I see nothing in there about taxation being theft. Right. It seems very inconsistent. If you're going to talk about wage theft, that you would include taxation in there. Right. Uh, otherwise, it's very hypocritical. It doesn't mean to say that you are actually against wage theft. It seems like you're hypocritically advocating for wage and uh, for that for those entitlements and not actually calling them as as they well, are. These people are them. supposedly against the state. They're anarchists, but right. Come on. All right, I've seen it kind of hypocritical in that stance. You know, be against all theft, right? Don't be against, well, theft in this section, that well, section. Well, paying for your own uniform isn't theft at all. Right, yeah. If I don't right. want to pay for my uniform, I'll, you know, I'll go work with someone else. I don't want to pay for my uniform. Right, you can go to Starbucks. I think Starbucks maybe requires you. It comes out of your paycheck. Like, then don't work at Starbucks. There's a lot of other places where they don't require you, to, you know, to pay for your uniform. Yeah. Um, so well, that doesn't even have a uniform. I right. mean, as long as I'm wearing black, uh, yeah. I have a name tag. That's my uniform. Right. There's no one pointing guns at you, right? Which you will find under taxation. So, I mean, there's a lot of... That's where the serious theft is occurring from. You know, mm -hmm. imagine again what you can do when nearly half your income is not being stolen. Uh, so, in the next area, we have 51% have a favorable view of the Affordable Care Act. So, well, you're kind of being duped. <laughs> Half of you are being duped into thinking that you actually really kind of need this particular healthcare. Whereas in the past, you look at maybe friendly societies and places where healthcare used to be so cheap and affordable, and it was uh, really kind of given, given around in these communities that people invested in uh, before government started outlaw competition. Because the last thing government wants for communities of individual people to, to have is independence, right? They need you to be dependent on their Medicare, on their Medicaid, on their Affordable Health well, Act. You know, um, Milton Friedman. Um uh, uh, quintessentially Chicago school economist, he, uh, he wrote a paper um, where he was basically outlining um, Gammon's Law. Now, Gammon's Law is uh, developed <laughs> by Dr. Max Gammon, who um, basically what he did was he went in and he analyzed the British nationalization of their healthcare system um, with the hypothesis in place that perhaps doing this would create kind of a black hole of spending where... Um, quality would kind of go down where spending would go up where bureaucracy would increase and it would just be this vortex of of uh is creating the, the blob mm -hmm. and uh gammon's law proved to be more or less 
consistent and true. And uh, Friedman accepted this, and uh, he wanted to apply it in um, the United States. And I believe that this was published in 1991. Um, he published a, a, a short essay on Gammon's Law in the United States healthcare, uh, healthcare System. And he notes that, um, that in the United States from the year 1946 to 1989, uh, that with the in introduction of uh, Medicare and Medicaid in 65, uh, what we had was um, the amount of personnel per hospital bed uh, increasing by, I believe, sevenfold, and the cost per bed um, increasing an astounding, adjusted for inflation, 26 times, hmm. which is ridiculous. And that's, that's from data ending in 1989. Can you imagine what that would be now? Yeah, yeah. You know? Um, so, so you can see these things aren't making things more affordable for people. More affordable for people. For people, what they're doing is they're just raising costs because those subsidies get captured by the institutions, which are already kind of exempt from a lot of competition via occupational licensure requirements, um, via many kinds of, of business regulations. Uh, so, when you think of Obamacare, you know it's a top-down kind of authoritarian, uh, almost you know. I, I don't like to make any kind of guilty by association fallacies, but almost like a Nazi-style healthcare system, um, because uh, it's a mandate for consumers, a mandate for consumers to buy, and a mandate for producers to sell via insurance. Uh, and uh, you know, I get a good laugh out of it every time I hear the president say something like, "Oh, well, I'm going to mandate an increase in demand for insurance and not have prices go up." Right. Uh, you'd have to be playing with with magic, with uh, you, you know, fictional entities that that can that can govern the world outside of reality. Uh, there, there, that's that's impossible. If the costs are even fixed via law, you're going to see those costs somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, so you know, this government intervention, uh, according to, to Friedman and to, to Gammon, uh, doesn't work doesn't help it makes the problem considerably worse in fact astoundingly worse i i knew i actually when i read this study by friedman i, I expected i knew that that these subsidies um to consumers of healthcare to institutions uh would increase costs and increase bureaucracy i was actually surprised still at the amount to which they did uh and i was surprised at figures that were coined coined in uh 1989 um, I'm scared to see what they would be in 2014. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of frightened. <laughs> it's not affordable for, for a lot of people, especially for many of my, our mm -hmm. friends here in Richmond. Um, many of them are kind of devastated economically right. because of that. It's very surprising that in the substantial rate that it has increased, um, where it seems to be cheaper for them. Uh, so I have a lot of dear friends who have been affected by this. Um, right, and, but, and, and you know, uh, it was effective for people, uh, early seemingly so, throughout much of, you know, the later 20th century, but eventually those bills have to be paid, and that's our generation. Right. The, the generation taking this survey, uh, that's going to be paying those. Right. So when you think about Obamacare, which is just more of uh, advancing the same poor policies, uh, for, for millennials that are going to be cost-driven uh, to, to have to pay for this, uh, which they can't do um, realistically or be expected to do. Right. Uh, it's kind of a sad thing because it's you're almost like uh, you, you, you know, you're endorsing your own execution. Um, yeah, yeah. You're, you're uh, I guess, uh, um, testifying against yourself <laughs> in, in many ways. Now, it, it's only 51%. I mean, I'm no supporter of democracy. Right. Uh, but yeah, again, this is another area in which uh, many youthful people who do not need this are, are being forced to subscribe to this, being forced to enter the system, again, to pay for the older generations. Right. Um, and if it's such a great business. idea, why does it have to be a mandate? Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, everyone always was saying when the Supreme Court was ruling on the law, if they strike down the individual mandate, they've, they've ripped out the heart of the law. Well, why, why, what? You know, I mean, if it's, a, let's have the, if you want to have that law, don't mandate me to, a, to abide by it, and if it's such a great idea, I will. Right. You know? Remember, Obama was saying, you can keep your private insurance uh, oh company. Oh, my God. Yeah. So that's a lie. And he had to lie. That's the only way for... There, there's a, actually a website there. called youcan'tkeepit.com or <laughs> <laughs> where they, people post pictures of their, their insurance company denying them health care. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> health insurance. Make I mean. sure you sign up. You know, even though our website sucks and doesn't work, right? And it'll be at your expense. Yeah, they can't efforts. make the website work. Well, Unless you think they can make anything else work, right? Yeah. The World of Warcraft has a good functioning website with millions of people. We on have service. a website that yeah. functions. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's no, well, not you, at all. You do. I no, uh, it's our community website. Okay. Uh, and the next one would be um, we got okay. Um, 68% say government should ensure everyone makes a living wage. Well, this kind of goes back to that, that minimum wage thing. Um, look, if government's going to make sure that, if the federal government's going to make sure everyone has a living wage, then the best thing they can do is outlaw state minimum wages. 
um, that would be <laughs> the way to make sure that happens um, because you know this goes back to you know what money is you're not trading with paper you're trading with labor so if you associate a greater amount of paper with the same amount of labor or the same I guess value of labor then you're going to devalue the paper you're not going to increase the value of the the, the labor right you know and remember uh, if you really are advocating for a living wage then you will also advocate against the amount that are being stolen from you from that wage right taxes again mm -hmm. uh, and all that stuff adds up um, so again you know don't be uh, and there's a lot of hypocritical stances out there in which they'll, they'll advocate against all different kinds of wage slavery except for that you know come on be consistent universalize your principle if you're against all theft be concretely have that integrity to be against all theft and that includes government thefting as well 66% uh, says raising taxes on the wealthy would help the economy. <sighs> raising taxes on the wealthy. Again, uh, and that's what I would define politics. Politics is uh, defined as uh, having the conversation of discussion how best to violently well, control the lives of others. Um, Ludwig von Mises points out, actually, well, many, many people did, but he was the first one to hit it really hard, was uh, well, when someone makes a profit, that is a signal that they're doing something really well. You know, like your, your your business is operating well. Um, your company is, you know, satisfying consumer needs. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you make a little bit of a profit, it means you're doing all right. You could be better. When you make a substantial profit, then you're you're doing very well. And when you're losing money, a little bit of money, you know, you need to change something up. Or when you're losing a lot of money, you either go out of business or you need to make massive reforms. Yeah. And that's kind of how people kind of communicate throughout markets. You know, there's other things too. It's a little more complicated than that. But in a nutshell, profits... Uh, profit and loss governs those things. Yeah, it, it signifies, it communicates that the consumers appreciates this product. So, right? so when a person is basically saying that you know we'll tax the wealthy, well, the if 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 you're wealthy because you're running a big company, um, then taxing that is almost like disrupting the market in a way that well, you people wouldn't feel that they're doing as well as they are. They wouldn't have an idea of how. Because uh, all that all that profit is is really just a validation of success, right? Um, and uh, you know that that sounds like that sounds <laughs> that sounds so politically incorrect. It's a you know? it's a distraction but, for you to focus on how much other people have instead of working on yourself and increasing your own productivity and your own right. capital and now, your own well being. It's, uh, yeah, so it's like for example, people say, "Well, look how many houses uh, Bill Gates has. Like, who, how, how does that affect me Who in cares? any way, shape, or form?" Right? How much uh, amount of uh, items and products or money other people have in no way, shape, or form affects me? I don't think about it. I don't sleep right. on it. It's like I focus on my own well-being. I focus on increase, increasing my own wealth, uh, my own productivity, my own skills, and resume. Uh, and that's where you, the attention should be drawn to, not in the distraction of being so overtly jealous that you would advocate stealing from other people because uh, right. you have not done so well yourself. Instead of looking why you haven't done. So so, well, um, and there's a lot of attributed reasons, and you can point to the state now, for that. Now, I am sympathetic, though, to some people who, you know, criticize some of these companies in the sense that, well, a lot of them are subsidized, a lot of them That's are, have, yeah. uh, you know, political connections, and it's not really natural. Their profits aren't really uh, what they would be if without state intervention. Right. Um, but then, uh, as the as the uh, I guess the cure to this to say, well, the, this we need because we need the state to do whatever because of the state. The state to tax the people who they're basically, you know, in, in you know collaboration with, uh, because the state's in collaboration with them is very inconsistent. I would recommend a much different policy prescription. Yeah, uh, I would, you know, advocate for abolishing the state. Right? Uh, you were talking about there are corporations or businesses in which are successful because of state intervention, because of state subsidies and influence. Uh, but remember, don't attack, don't go after the the monsters that this Dr. Frankenstein, the state is creating. Go after Dr. Frankenstein itself to end those kind of uh, monstrous uh, creations. Uh, so if Bill Gates, you know, relying on IP for his success, and a lot of many uh, businesses do, uh, go after the source that's kind of causing that and creating that, uh, I guess, allowance for that to occur, and that is the state. Uh, not corporations, don't fall for the distractions. Mm -hmm. Go after the state and the state, the state-backed corporations cease to exist as well. I mean, you even have like uh, companies like Monsanto, where, you know, they have former, yeah. they're a one of their former attorneys in the Supreme Court, right? and their, their old VP is now like the president of the FDA, you know, Michael Taylor. Um, all that stuff. So I mean, yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of uh, a lot I don't like about big companies. But it's not necessarily the fact that you're a big company. It's how you get there that's going to you know affect how I view the, the the company. Right. Right. So the next one we have. Um, okay. Yeah. Here we go. Um, Fifty-eight percent say the government should spend more on assistance to the poor, even if it means higher taxes. That's um, a contradiction. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, remember, a lot of people are poor because of taxes, and you can also include taxes in the depreciation value of the currency, which yeah, is inflation's why inflation's a tax. Yeah, inflation is a tax. Inflation's right? a tax you don't vote for. Right, and so a lot of people who are impoverished who do need uh, help, right, uh, assistance, and the last thing you would want is a monopolization of the currency. And the last thing, again, you want is a state to monopolize these services, which will come at their own expense. Uh, so increasing uh, taxes comes at their expense too, it comes at the expense of the poor, right? right? Uh, stealing from them to help from them doesn't really help <laughs> them at all. Uh, so it's, and that's that's not necessarily a, again, this, this goes back to misunderstanding of what is taxation. And a lot of textbooks do not define what is taxation. Again, they define it as distribution, right? Or, they can't yeah. outright tell you that it's theft, because then if they did, then everyone would be against it. They I mean, I th to... I'm pretty sure it's actually in the, the text of the Social Security Act that, um, your your social security tax is a contribution. A contribution. A, a, a contribution. Yeah, in fact, as if you know you had a choice. Right. You know. Yeah. Fast forward, sugar coated, just to deceive you yeah. and mislead you and distract you. And, and a lot of the stuff, when you have a mandate, you're not subject to you know um, satisfaction of consumers. Uh, so, you know, maybe the social security system would be somewhat viable. Uh, if they had, you know, profit and loss to say, well, are we doing this well enough? Or, mm -hmm. you know, is it because, because, you know, if this was a company, people would look at the, like, if it were to just be like, you know, from here on now, this is now a private company. People will look and say, that's not a good investment. Yeah. But but some people but now people's perception is well you know I paid all this money I've got to pay this money so you know let me be optimistic about it even if it's totally foolish to be right um, so you know raising tax on the wealthy you know it's kind of the same thing putting it towards you know programs that are kind of insolvent that really did sort of perpetuate um, uh, poverty uh, food stamps programs I mean you know you have more people on food stamps now than when the program was started percentage wise yep um, if it was a company success is measured by if the problem is remedied. Right. Um, so if po poverty was a problem, well, there's less people who need assistance. Well, because government's doing it, there's more. Right. Before Lyndon's war on, uh, on, on, on poverty, uh, mm -hmm. actually, the, uh, the poverty rates were declining. 1% per year after World War II. Declining. Until 65. Right. And then as a result of government intervening uh, in trying to restrict uh, competitors, trying to find a, an amicable solution to this. Remember, the last thing government wants are people who are independent. They need people to be dependent on government. So in the beginning of uh, the Food Stamps Act, uh, you have uh, tens of thousands of people, about 30,000, 32,000 people. Now you have uh, millions of people uh, dependent on there. Uh, I mean, we should we should just be consistent use percentages because the population is bigger, you know. Right. But uh, still, still, you know, points the same. Right. Um, and, you know, uh, I had a government teacher back in, in uh, uh, my senior year of high school, and he was telling me about, um, like, uh, like uh, welfare programs and, and whatnot. And uh, he, he, he mentioned to, to the class that uh, he has a dog and he has, he has a cat at home, and uh, he likes the dog a lot, but he doesn't trust the cat. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't like the cat very much. And the reason he doesn't like the cat very much is the cat, the cat never eats the food it gives him, but keeps on eating. Right. And the cat doesn't need him. You know, so the cat, mm, you know, so does the government want you to be the dog? I mean, I'm a dog person, by the way, but, uh, or they want you to be the cat in that situation. They want you to be the dog, you know? I mean, they yeah. want you always to be there to get the food, and they, you know? Um, I mean, we're kind of getting off topic because this was about no, but, so as long as uh, you depend on government, that's how government exists. As long um, as you advocate for it and think that you need it, you know, I have a, uh, that, that legitimizes the idea that you need a, a, this such, a, such a violent organization to begin with. Uh, and we're going to speed up for, for the next few points here. So 54% uh, favor a larger government that provides more services when taxes are not mentioned. Again, this goes in the areas in which, uh, yeah, it sounds great, tax uh, improvement, uh, greater uh, government services. But, of course, when you don't include taxes, uh, people are more averse to that. Right. Uh, so naturally, of course, people will kind of go inclined to that. But, again, you know, in defining terms, you know, this is, uh, and when we're talking about uh, the battle, this war against chaos, the war against the state, we're also talking about battle against words, um, battle against philosophy, and that's what, essentially what the state is. They have a great control over the concepts uh, that we do use, and they uh, mislead us into believing otherwise uh, into their abstract definitions, which have nothing of value in, in the concrete world. Uh, like distribution is not the same thing as, uh, like, as theft but they will like to include it the same way and disguise it differently as well. So, 67% of millennials favor legalizing same-sex marriage. Now, that's not that's not a bad thing at all. Um, if we could just get them to go that one extra step towards totally privatizing marriage, right. you know, we, we'd be somewhere. Because uh, if you want the government out of your bedroom, don't let them subsidize your marriage. Don't let them tell you what your, what your, what your relationship is. Um, and that's only accomplished with the privatization of marriage, which I think is, um, if someone really wants 
marriage equality, and that's what they would advocate for. If someone really wants the government out of your bedroom, that's what they would advocate for. Right, and don't forget that the uh, people who are against racism, you know, then the last thing organization you want to support and advocate for is the government, because the foundation of these uh, why government got involved in the Marriage Act to begin with was to prevent interracial marriages to begin with. Uh, so they have very racist roots, even in the involvement today for that. And now they find that, well, you know, we can make a lot of money by licensing it. All right, so there's another extortion scheme. 59% say the government should allow online gambling. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. All but right. then you look at like a Virginia Lotto, for example, that's perfectly okay for, you know, to, for, for them to yeah. kind of pray and gamble uh, allowed here. But like, as long as the government does it, it's okay for you to do it and have your own website, a lot of uh, online websites. Go back to Social Security down. again. Bernie Madoff got arrested for the Social Security program. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's also gambling. Uh, okay, so we got uh, our 57% uh, say marijuana should be legal, although, although only 22% say cocaine should be legal. Um, so that's basically, honestly, I'm kind of surprised that number yeah, wasn't higher. Yeah, so am I, so am I. Um, but I'm just, I'm a college student, so of course I'm surprised. <laughs> right. Uh, so again, don't, uh, even in the terms of legalization, remember, that's, uh, we're, we're not dogs, right? Yeah, we're yeah, not animals. Permission. We, yeah, we, we want all our freedoms, not scraps of freedoms. And that's what the state and government is trying to provide you. That's what they're holding up here. After 75 years, they finally have the freedom to smoke a plant. That's not a measure of success. Well, it's not even the freedom to smoke a plant. It's, you know, we're going to let you. Yeah, we're going to let you. We're going to yeah. give you permission, right? But at the same time, you still got to give us some some of your money for it, right? Yeah. You're removing uh, the replacement of different kind of violence from throwing you to a cage to being dehumanized to being raw forthright to taxation. Right, and then uh, also if you're going to use the, the, the argument that you own your body, well then, you know, there's 35% um, that are being somewhat inconsistent when wanting to legalize marijuana and then not, not as well uh, harder drugs. Right. Um, because, you know, the principle then necessarily would, would stay the same. It's all, you know, personal decision. Right. And again, it's a form uh, to kind of play safety. That's all it is. It's like, all right, after certify, we'll let them have it until the, the masses, you know, the tacklers are angry enough after another 75 years, they'll give you another. And there's the arbitration back. too. You know, you have like the age you have to be to buy it. Um, right. Which is, the, you know, I mean, you can take the drinking age too, just because that's probably the one we're most, uh, most um, I guess, well versed with is, you know, there, there are some people who are going to be, you know, reckless and alcoholics, whether they're, you know, 14, 21 or 30, you know, and then there's some people that would be fine at 14, 21, or 30, or 20, or 30, you know. So uh, there's this, you know, government can't really think individualistically. They have to collectivize everything. They just have to say for the sake of convenience, for the sake of being able to, you know, write the paperwork and bureaucratize everything. Um, the, the standard is, you know, 21, that's just the way it is for everybody. Whereas right. you had a completely free market in terms of, um, you know, drugs or, or alcohol, you know, some people say alcohol is a drug, or, you know, tobacco, um, then, you know, you, you have more more individual preferences catered to where people are actually acknowledged for what, for their own merits or their own vices or virtues, yeah. um, rather than just this one, you know, arbitrary uh, verdict. Coming right. From, yeah. All right. And, and that goes into the last topic here with 52% uh, say either the government should not set a legal drink in age or that legal drink in age should be lower than 21. Remember, uh, we did a video covering here on vices are not crimes. So, like, it's perfectly fine for the government to send you at the age of 18, 16 or 17 if you and your parents sign you away to be murdered overseas, uh, you know, to be used as cotton fodder. But it's okay for you to send you to give you a gun to murder strangers you've never met. But, uh, you know, but not okay for you to imbibe in a bit of alcohol as well. Um, and again, this is a prohibition era of uh, leftover, right? Uh, there wasn't really much of this kind of problem in the past, but this is uh, something that ends up happening when you let government monopolize. Here in Virginia, for example, they've monopolized uh, the distribution, wholesale, and retail sale of alcohol, right? Uh, so this is uh, kind of what ends up happening when you have government involvement with it. There's no convenience for you to, to have. You have to go to an extra store to get your, your alcohol when it's no different than beer or, or wine. Uh, and when you when you think about it too, like this is uh, one of the one of the big um, I guess um, advancements of the mid twentieth century that that government still hasn't caught up with is well people finally didn't have to go to the butcher for their meat or to the um, to the, 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 the or wait for the milkman for the dairy you know so they can get everything in one place they have a supermarket well you know government's basically just holding that up in one more area and that is the distilled spirits area yeah you know yeah. Um, so to sum up all of this, that's uh, essentially what the millennials are about, uh, so to speak. But I wouldn't just put it with millennials. I found this to be the case with uh, a lot of people, regardless of their age, that they do not have a, none of their own fault in understanding, that they don't have a good understanding of what is socialism, what is capitalism, what is consent. 
Uh, for example, there's a city political body politic here in which they have a consent agenda. And of course, that's like <laughs> consent agenda. You don't even know how to define consent uh, in, in those particular terms because there exists no consensual relationship with government. It's coercive, it's oppressive, it violates that to very begin with. Uh, so, and that's as a result of growing up under statism, as a result of going through public indoctrination school for 12 years. And it continues to resume when you go into uh, these worthless college programs as well. Um, so government doesn't really have a good job in providing this measure and there's good reason why. They don't want you to find out the truth. They don't want you to actually look out there measurably and objectively understand what is going on around you. They don't want you to acknowledge it as what it is, which is just another form of organized crime. Right. The better that they can deceive you and mislead you, you know, works well for them. As long as you believe the government works, that's all they want you to believe. Uh, if you still advocate for government, still think a reform can work, great. As long as you're advocating for government, that's really it. Uh, and to continue so forth. But uh, as we have seen, there's a large, uh, measurable distrust of government, and let's continue going there, and let's start looking uh, objectively. And you'll find in, in your own studies uh, that the common denominator for all our social ills and problems is government itself, and that in itself must be abolished. So with that, this is Kamolane. Matt Badalioli. See you guys at the Victory Party. Take good care.